All right. We'll uh, go ahead and get started, and I, more people will wander in. Uh, this is a class on God's amazing creation. We've looked at uh, different aspects of it, the mountains, uh, space, and you see the volcanoes. Uh, this slideshow will go around so you won't miss anything if you're watching it. Uh, if you're not paying attention to me, that's okay. <laughs> because it's amazing creation and uh, things like that uh, just are staggering. We'll, hopefully we'll wrap up a few things at the end because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what we'll talk about today. But uh, there are some things. We're going to talk about the human body in particular. So we'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to read uh, Psalm 95, just the uh, first few verses. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. His hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our, ma our Maker, for He is our God, and we are His people of His pasture, the flock under His care. And so, uh, using creation as a way to uh, praise God uh, in this and a number of Psalms, uh, which some of which we've already read. So, uh, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into it. Father, we're indeed thankful and uh, that You've blessed us so richly, but. Bless us in seeing your creation and the amazing way you have put things together and how it all works and, uh, and just amazing pictures from space and uh, things like that. So we're, we're very grateful that we can see this and, and then praise you and uh, stand in awe of what you have done. We're thankful for all your blessings. In his name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Uh, there's a... We're going to wrap up just a maybe a little bit on uh, birds, and then we're going to go into, uh, into the human body. But there's a, a song that I like. It's a children's song, but it's mostly sung by folk singers. Uh, this, the lyrics of this particular uh, version of it come from Celtic Thunder. So if you want to get online and look up uh, A Place in the Choir and Celtic Thunder, uh, they have a really good uh, thing to it. But, uh, I won't repeat uh, all the uh, chorus, but the chorus goes, All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got. Listen to the, listen to the top where the little bird sings on the melodies and the high notes ringing. And the hoot owl cries over everything and the blackbird disagrees. Singing in the nighttime, singing in the day, when the little duck quacks and he's on his way, and the otter hasn't got much to say, and the porcupine talks to himself again. The dogs and the cats, they take up the middle, while the honeybee hums and the cricket fiddles, the donkey brays and the pony neighs, and the old gray, gray badger sighs. Listen to the bass, it's the one on the bottom, where the bullfrog croats and the hippopotamus moans and groans with big uh, to-do, and the old cow just goes moo. It's a simple song, a little song everywhere, by the ox and the fox and the grizzly bear, the dopey alligator and the hawk above, the sly old weasel and the turtle dove. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire, and some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got. And I really like that because it's, it just it, it, when I first heard it, I said, you know, that's God, <laughs> His creation, <laughs> bring all these things. That's right. These are animals who do what God wants, and as they do, they are praising God. And, and I just like that. Uh, we've gotten through a lot of this, but uh, I was just looking over the. Uh, list here there's uh, birds there's a lot of study done on birds i was scanning an article this week and uh, uh, they were looking at pa uh, patterns of migration for birds and they're, they're on the island of crete and they're they're sitting there and all of a sudden they said we had like 
and the, the number, I don't know how they figured this out, but 39 million insects came flying by. Uh, and just, they were like, they had to duck and hide, and most of them were flies. Uh, but there were other species in there. And they were migrating. They came from Africa over the Mediterranean, through Crete, and on going up north. And that, you think, insects, <laughs> just an amazing things that go there. And so that's just some of the things that we see. Uh, there's the uh, archaeology is helping out uh, in a number of ways uh, of looking more so at uh, what um, human beings have done. Uh, there's a, a gal that's an archaeologist, but she also uses satellites, infrared, and drones. And then she's been flying over the Middle East, especially in Egypt. And she's finding with this technology that the towns that they've been looking at and estimated populations are probably off because buried under the ground, these towns have a lot more to it. So what they thought was maybe you know, five square miles might be 15 square miles. I, that's an exaggeration, but I, that's the idea that's going on. And so we see humanity and, and the things that they do. God's given us a brain to create things. We talk about the pyramids. We talk about uh, Rome. Uh, just a little, another little article about their aqueducts and their, their ability to make a type of cement nobody has duplicated. Uh, and this, this stuff lasts for centuries. It's lasted for actually almost two millennia. Uh, in, uh, and you see the aqueducts still active. Uh, sending water along. Uh, and they built some amazing things. Man has that ability. Yeah, they just discovered in Spain about a month ago the Spanish Stonehenge because yeah. uh, the drought is, had is reduced the lake to such a degree that there's the Spanish Stonehenge. And, and of course, it's built on the stars, right. the alignment of the stars. Yeah, so it's man and his ability to reason yeah. and it can do these amazing things. And so we see that even today. Uh, and when I thought we were fearful, Psalm 139 says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and what does that mean? What, how do we look at that? I read a book uh, a number of years ago. It came out in 2000. It's called Ghost Soldiers. Uh, there was a movie made of it as well. And it's about uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers who were captured on Corregidor and marched on the Bataan Death March up into the Philippines, into the uh, main part of the northern island of the Philippines to a, constant, uh, a prisoner of war camp uh, in the middle of the Philippines. I, when I was over there, I would pass by that a number of times. Uh, we see the name anyway. And, uh, and it's a name that's hard to pronounce. Kabana Twan. That's it. <laughs> or Howard. So uh, the Army Rangers were sent in there to uh, rescue these mm -hmm. soldiers because they had word that the Japanese were going to execute them all. And they rescued all these soldiers, and they found the, they were some of them couldn't walk. They had to be carried. Others they had lost about half their body. All of them had lost half their body weight. Uh, they had a variety of diseases. Not one, but a variety. And so they brought them back to the American lines. Of course, they went to the hospitals. And they started taking care of them, uh, treating the diseases, getting them on a good diet. And then at the end uh, of that particular thing, they put them on a, a, a transport. We've heard of the phrase, a slow boat to China. Well, they put them on a slow boat to the States. They told them to go a longer way. And while they were headed that way, they fed them. And by the time they got to to uh, the West Coast, San Francisco, or whatever, they had regained most all of their body yeah. weight. Uh, now, this book was written that, that came out in 2000, and the author uh, interviewed these people in the late 90s, interviewed these survivors in the late 90s. <laughs> That's 50 years after what they had gone through. And so you can think that some of them were probably 20, in, you know, at least around 20 and a lot older. Uh, at the time they went through the event. So these people are in the 70s and 80s. And you just think of the amazing recovery power of the human body. Uh, my dad was, uh, in 1958, 
uh, had a detached retina. We lived in Patterson, New Jersey. The only place they could do anything about it was in New York City. And so he had to go down there to have surgery. And he was going to be there seven days. He'd have to lay on his back all seven days with two patches on his eyes, and he couldn't move. That's how they did it. And I remember going to see him in a ward, if some of you remember the wards, uh, and see him and laying there with these two patches, not much he could do. In 2005, I had a detached retina. I went to the doctor, he said, well, we'll go uh, to the, here's what we'll do. You come in on a, a certain morning, or Tuesday morning, I don't remember, what. Tuesday morning, uh, you'll, we'll fix your eye and send you home by noon. <laughs> And that, just that period of time, how amazing things were, were changing. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, and if I could tolerate the light, here's the really amazing thing. If I could have tolerated the laser light, he would have done it in the office. Uh, so technology, yeah. somebody's thinking up this stuff and moving it along. Uh, we think of gallbladders uh, uh, and uh, hysterectomies. I remember visiting any number of people in the in the hospital five days in the hospital five to seven days in the hospital after gallbladder surgery or a hysterectomy months of recovery and now today it's three holes three or four holes uh you know suck those things out of there <laughs> and you're home in the evening or the next day uh, your recovery is about a month and then you're back to work and mm -hmm. the, the amazing thing is they even have uh, for pain, they have a, a type of th a disposable pain thing that you that's in there that injects the medicine at a certain amount of time pain to pump. keep the pain pain pump. Pain pump yeah. yeah, and it, it, I, it's, it just amazes me. Uh, it's almost like looking at Star Trek, you know, with his little thing, yeah. you know, and and seeing what's going on. Uh, we were talking to Ken about uh, open heart surgery. Uh, and today, the first time I saw an open heart surgery patient was in 1988. Walked onto the second floor. I was going to go visit her in the uh, in ICU, and I came off the elevator, turned right, and there she was, walking toward me with a nurse, all hooked up to everything. But they had her up and walking one day after yeah. surgery, and now they find that that's the best thing to do: get people up and moving uh, immediately and not letting them lay in bed for uh, a week or more. My daughter, one, our daughter, is, uh, our youngest, is a paramedic. Uh, and this comes from somewhat from the combat uh, situations that American troops have been in in the last few years. Uh, we know about tourniquets. You put a tourniquet on and help the bleeding. And there was a, a period of time where they said, well, that's not good, so we can't do that. But they've come down and just said, look, here's the, here's the choice you have. Either he bleeds to death or he loses a limb. You gotta make, you know, put the tourniquet on, save the life, we'll deal with the other with the limb as needed. Well, you look at people today, combat veterans, and what some of them, I, you hear their stories, and it, in some ways it's sad, but here are people who wanna survive. So now they have prosthetic legs and arms, uh, they are able to move around and do things. Uh, machines have been developed, wheelchair type machines, uh, almost like a, the treads like a tank, and you go anywhere on those things. Uh, they are they participate in sports. There's a gal that's advertised on uh, tunnels for towers uh, or tunnels to towers, and she is a hockey player. Uh, uh, she doesn't have legs. She just does this on the, you know, on a, a certain type of uh, thing that she can uh, skate along, and and there's a lot of them doing that. So there's just amazing things that go on. A few years ago, well, this has been a little more than a few years ago. I was reading uh, a story about the paper that comes out of uh, Austin's, uh, oh, it's the church's uh, Austin school there, uh, connected with the university. Uh, and I can't think of the name offhand, but uh, was had a one of their uh, the wives of one of their students uh, was having twins. This is their first kids, and the uh, there was a problem there, 
And the doctor told her she's going to have to pick one of, the tw one of them to be aborted because they can't survive. And she wouldn't accept that as a, a legitimate means of doing something. So she did research and found that there were some doctors working on uh, this type of problem in, in Houston, I believe. And so she went to them and said, yeah, we can, we can do this. And what they did was at about 24 weeks, they operated on the babies in the womb. So they're 24 weeks in the, and they're operated uh, did what they needed to do to take care of the situation and she at nine months she gave delivery to two twins the picture they show in the magazine is that the twins are eight years old and the, they have siblings that are younger uh, and they look like little girls I mean that's just what they you know, typical little girls but you just operating on a baby in a womb just amazing uh, what we have uh, in our ability. The human body, like creation, has amazing recovery power. Uh, I like folk music, so uh, some of these uh, illustrate, or at least one of these, comes from a song called The 60-Year-Old Waltz. <laughs> and it's about growing older. And when you get to 60, and, and the part of the song about that, uh, one of the famous phrases that I like is, uh, or one of the fa phrases I like is, uh, self-destructing body parts are trying to do me in yeah. and uh, and you think about it well yeah you, we can remove a gallbladder uh, we can, you can live with one lung and one kidney you can livers can grow again which is just so you can share you can share a liver with a, uh, uh, someone you know, and your your liver will regenerate uh, and this is what it, it's done in, in creation and we talked about that how the earth rejuvenates how it rebuilds itself how it restores itself and it's done with the human body as well uh, and, and amazing things a, a person with a, uh, a good attitude can uh, you know have that happen and and you know we have surgeries and we have medicines and to keep a, a, we're living longer uh, and that's because people think about uh, are thinking or using what God has given us uh, to go on. Um, I just wanted to add to what you said about the body, the primitive itself. The body start working when we're sleeping. Uh -huh. um, so, that's when all the repairs yeah. <laughs> is taking place while we're asleep. Right. That's why they always encourage. So why we need body. that? That day of rest, and yes. yeah, you know, that's why that's important. Yes. And of course, again, in the biblical times, they didn't have TVs. And so you either sat around the fire and told stories or you went to sleep. So I, I just, uh, and I guess we, we sit around TVs. <laughs> yeah, I hyped up or something. I don't know. Anyway. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that are going on in, uh, in God's amazing creation. Uh, so to kind of wrap this up, uh, uh, the last few minutes that we have, uh, uh, God has given us a responsibility to take care of creation. And that includes ourselves, obviously. Uh, I know uh, there's some paranoia about doctors uh, in, this, in the world. <laughs> some people uh, get, wouldn't trust a doctor uh, to, and this is a family experience, uh, so not my side. <laughs> I, I had two doctors and a nurse in my family, so I didn't have to worry about that. And a paramedic, so. Uh, but anyway, you know, people. Some people don't. Doctors are are beneficial. Yeah. But we're also responsible for creation. That doesn't mean we shouldn't use it. God has blessed us in a number of ways oil and gas and things like that that are beneficial for mankind They're, that humans are used we we have uh, air conditioning certainly needed here and uh, heat if you're up north you like to have the heat um, and these are consistent things that really help us uh, and uh, and will benefit we have the ability to grow crops uh, make crops uh, resistant to diseases or resistant to uh, critters uh, insects that would destroy them normally 
Uh, these are important. God has blessed us with people who have the scientific ability to do that. Uh, and uh, they have blessed the world with food. Uh, we have a lot of food production. Unfortunately, there's a movement now where they're, they want to change all that. And, and we won't get into that. But I think there's, uh, we have to be alert to that and careful. There's uh, risks and benefits in everything. And this morning, we all got up. Then you put your foot, feet, well, if you can get that far, get your feet on the ground, you've taken a risk. Standing up, at my age, is a risk. Yeah. Especially if you do it fast. <laughs> you know, and you start floating your rent. Uh, there, there's risk getting in the car and driving here. Uh, there's, uh, we tease Bobby because there's a smell out here uh, when we first walk in, it smells like gas. And I'm thinking, well, if you light a match, we have this building be gone, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know what's going on with that. That's something else. <laughs> but, you know, there's risks in everything. Uh, we could all, I, you know, any of us could go out, drive our car, go through that green light, have an 18-wheeler wipe us out halfway down 1960, or the Cypress Expressway or whatever they call it today. So, yeah, there's risks in everything. There's risks in taking medicine. We understand that. So we have to say, is it worth it or not? And some people say, no, it's not worth it. Uh, my mother-in-law, she was given a choice. Uh, she had leukemia. It wasn't good. Uh, you know, she was going uh, about a year to live. And they, the doctor said, I'll give you two choices. I can, we can do chemo, but you'll be out of it. She said, I don't want that. So said, okay, well, we'll go. They decided to go more natural means, at least to make her comfortable. And so that's the way they went. That's a choice. Is there a risk to that? Sure. But there were risks to the chemo, and, and she, again, weighed the things, and she chose uh, what she thought would be more beneficial. And I think for the family, that was, uh, was important. So uh, God has created everything. And it's beneficial, though sometimes we really don't understand why. Uh, there's a snake in here somewhere, yeah. Yeah, if you haven't seen it. I was hard. I put it in there, they, I put it in there, but not for the reason that, you know, oh, you know, the devil and all that type of thing. I put it in there because even that critter has something that will be beneficial to mankind, beneficial for us. We don't know what it is, but that's something that research does along the way. It could be for the environment, or it could be for medical reasons for us. We just don't know. People are studying these things. They're looking at uh, what we can learn from that. And so uh, they're, uh, it, it's just that I think God has given us everything, whatever it is, that has beneficial means for cinnamon. Uh, cinnamon. You know, the stuff you put on toast and stuff like that it comes from a tree, as does aspirin. You know, who would have thought? <laughs> but, you know, there's some some person way back when said, oh, well, uh, it was chewing on some bark for some reason. Oh, boy, that pain's going away. I like this. You know, <laughs> this is where it's beneficial. Go ahead. Um, well, first of all, Kathy wanted me to tell you that uh, snake is good for for uh, the poison and is good for Botox. Yes. <laughs> well, we'll uh, we'll consider whether that's a risk yeah. or a bit. <laughs> okay. um, you know, we have a lot of the space program is beginning to build back up. Right. And we've over the years we've heard a lot of people saying. We should spend our money. We, you know, we, we, let's take care of the people here and don't be worried about mm -hmm. Martians and if there's water and all that. But what a lot of people don't understand, of course, I came up from a uh, uh, from a father who was a scientist and who was a, an mm -hmm. aerospace engineer and did some work for NASA. But um, a lot of the things that we enjoy today are coming from space. Right. Our technology, our medicines. We wouldn't have like the cell phones we have. We wouldn't have some of the medicines. We wouldn't have a lot, you know, some of the foods. Um, so we, we also need to consider not just the things that we have here that God has given us, but 
going out, you know, in outer space and collecting all that data yeah. and, and well, using well. it to make, our, you know, our lives better and to improve yeah. it. Tang. Yeah, I remember Tang. Everybody tank. remember Tang? Yeah. 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 That was a pretty good arm strength. Yeah. Yeah. That came from... I don't know. I'd like to forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that, you know, so that was... that. You're right, you know. we And that's the technology. Things yeah. have to be adapted to. And, and it's just like we, we think about war as a horrible thing. But are there benefits out of it? Well, in medicine there are. Because now the things that happen in Vietnam or earlier World War II in Korea uh, are not happening in current war uh, current wars because doctors know there are ways to treat things rapidly and there of course there's the technologies there to get soldiers from one end one part of the battlefield to another and then to a, a, a central location happens to be Germany uh, and where they are can save lives uh, you know, these are unexpected things, and out of that comes treatments uh, that are that are now applied to us, yep. not on the intensity of a war zone, right. but at least for our benefit. Right. So again, it's people thinking. You know, God's create, given us minds to think with, and it helped to develop these things. So we do have a responsibility to take care of the environment. There's no doubt about that. But there's things in the environment that are beneficial to us that we can use uh, to help others. And again, we, we've talked about some of that. Hey, George, I read something yesterday. You know, bugs are plentiful in the Houston area, and I don't, I don't see a useful world. But this article is talking about hummingbirds, and they're starting their migratory thing back to South mm -hmm. America. Well, they stop in the Houston area to fatten up, and everybody, th I always thought, you know, the, the nectar and stuff like that is what the book, but they get the bugs, and that's what puts the fat on them, the bugs. The, the nectar gives them energy, but the insects gives them the fat to make the trip across. Well, I wish they showed up in my house. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but they were saying, before they fatten up, you know, talking about their weight, take one potato chip. That's probably what they weighed when they first get here and they started. By the time they leave, by the time they fatten up, they weigh like four potato chips. Yeah. Wow. That's... And again, you think about how all that, all that works. You know, you have the, how God has designed these things to go along. And hummingbirds are fun to watch. You know, so in, a, in that sense, we like to see the hummingbirds. They're just fascinating. Now, I, maybe you don't think so, but I think they're, you see all these hummingbirds, especially if there's a lot of them. They're mean uh, if there's a bunch of them. So, huh? They're mean if there's a bunch of them. <laughs> and there's that too. So, you know, those are benefit, beneficial to us as well. Uh, and you have to wonder about insects too and where they fit into all this. But uh, again, as it, as it feeds creation, it's a good thing. Now there's a, there is a problem uh, in technology and insects and birds, and that's those windmills out in West Texas and other places. You, you drive along, you see, you count three uh, blades. But if you look at a fan in a certain way, you know, one of your household fans, you can count the blades as it spins around. But you're not going to stick your hand up in it because you know what's going to happen. It's going to hurt. Uh, I've done that when I was putting on the Oh, ah, ooh, that hurt. <laughs> You know, but these bla these uh, windmills out in the trees of West Texas, which is what I call them, they're spinning 200 miles an hour. Well, a bird sees three, three all he sees is three uh, blades. I can make it through there. Yeah, I can make it through there. Well, yeah. you know, and so uh, bird, uh, the, the things I've read, birds, bats, and insects are being wiped out on these things. And that's a, that's a dangerous thing. So. Are there benefits? Yes. Are there risks? Yes. Which is which is more beneficial, or maybe it's more risky, and we shouldn't do it. So it's kind of something we can look at. Another aspect to all this is uh, how we we read scripture, and creation is used a lot in scripture. If you just in your Bible reading side this year, I'm going to look at all the 
as I read through, I'm going to be aware of uh, when the biblical writers speak of creation in some way. And you'll find scenes of judgment. Uh, there's famines, there's uh, uh, wild animals, and just different things like that. And so uh, a lot of people will look at uh, that and say, well, uh, have some questions about it. Uh, how does that all work? Well, we have to be careful, and, and again, we go back to the, the volcanoes and the earthquakes and the hurricanes and things like that. Oh, God, it, it, God's judging us. And that becomes a hard thing to deal with, or a hard thing to, uh, to consider, because uh, we understand there's judgment, but we also have to understand there's other things. How, if God set the world in motion with hurricanes, earthquakes, and volcanoes, because they benefit the planet. How does that play a role in our understanding when God says he's using these things or things like famine to judge the world? Today, there seems to be a, a, a worldwide drought uh, throughout from North America, Europe, and Asia uh, where uh, if you read the art, different articles, there's just a lot of... Uh, I was reading an article about things that have been found in different areas as the waters receded, like Lake Mead and bodies. Yeah. Uh, in Europe, there's, uh, in one of the Balkan, former Balkan uh, countries, they found uh, a number of uh, Nazi warships that were sunk yeah. uh, and a bomb. <laughs> An American bomb. Oh, that was in Italy. They found an American bomb from World War II in the water and after it receded. Uh, that's an exciting uh, event always in Europe uh, because there's a lot of those still around. Uh, and even in China, uh, things are going down. Is this judgment? Or is this something that's... Uh, is it... Uh, something that reoccurs in, in cycles for whatever reason, and maybe we would say this might cause us to focus on God. Uh, God knows how things work. He knows what's going to happen. So we say he knows the future. Is, does he, in the Bible at least, does he know, for instance, uh, when things like uh, a famine will occur, or an earthquake will occur, and he will well, the famines and some of the other things. Well, will that say, well, when you see this, uh, you know that I'm responsible for this. Amos 3 says that. Uh, Amos 3 and 4 and Deuteronomy 27 and Leviticus 26 talk about that. So we can then say, well, this is a, an act of God. But is it an act of God? Is a, is a tornado or a hurricane an act of God, or is it just the way it's designed? And we just happen to be in the way. Uh, you know, if you, if you get out, go to Yellowstone, and you get out of your car, and there's a buffalo, uh, believe me, you don't want to be in the same place as that buffalo. Right. Uh, because he's bigger, <laughs> and he doesn't care who he runs over. Uh, Paul Harvey always uh, told a story uh, he, uh, he talked about this guy in the woods. He's out in the cabin somewhere, and he went out to the outhouse, and uh, his friends were kind of on the other side of the house, and they heard this noise, and they went around, and they, the outhouse is wiped out, and the guy is in the, buried under all that, and they dig him out and say, what happened? I have no idea. I was just sitting here, and next thing I know, the whole thing was all over me, and they looked, and there were tracks of a moose just... It, had, it was his time, it was the running season, he was headed for where he was headed, and it didn't matter what was in front of him. It was going to get wiped out, and those things are huge. And so, boom, he wiped, you know, and that's just, is that, sometimes we just get, we put ourselves in the way, and we don't think. If you move to Houston, you know, you got to think hurricanes. If you move to New Jersey, blizzards. It's the way it is. So, or, or North Dakota or something. And you can't come, go out and say, well, I didn't know it was going to be this. Well, no. And, and then you have to think, well, is this an act of God? But then 
is it really? Or is it the way it was designed to work? Uh, some people uh, will look at events. Lisbon had an earthquake in 1755. It was on a Sunday morning. I think it was a holiday, if I remember right. Uh, and uh, philosophically, that influenced a lot of philosophers to look and say, uh, both uh, in the Enlightenment and, uh, and this idea that uh, of God, we just need to reject it all. Uh, and, and go with whatever we can come up with. And so those, those were some things that went along. Philip Jenkins, in his book on, uh, on uh, it's, what is it, Climate, Catastrophe, and Faith, asks those types of questions. Uh, and he talks about uh, volcanoes and is this an act of God uh, or, or uh, is this a judgment of God or is this just the way things are and people just happen that that's the way it works. Interesting questions that I have no answers to. <laughs> and God does what he wants to do. And he does it his way. Uh, and uh, is, is it a built-in side? Of course, aging. You know, we're all getting a little older. Uh, now we're all mature. Okay, We are in that middle age, mature area. There's, there's no old people, well, George, other than George, there's no, I <laughs> uh, can't resist. <laughs> uh, we're all, you know, we're all growing old. And so, you know, we have to, we realize that. Because that's just part of the process. Uh, and so is earth, this all part of the process. It, how, sin affected the earth. But that doesn't make hurricanes and earthquakes and volcanoes evil. And so those are some of the things we have to kind of uh, look at as well. Okay, I'm going to stop there. and we got about five minutes. Anybody want to ask any questions or make any comments? Or uh, you, you are allowed to throw things. I still move pretty fast. I just wanted to touch base on the volcanoes. volcanoes. They are designed to release because if they didn't, it would be a terrible explosion. Right. It's just like they would say a vehicle ha has to release. Right. You know, you'll see a bump, just smoke, just like we do, excuse the expression, passing gas. Because <laughs> we have to release. Yeah, so we better. <laughs> God has designed it all yeah. to be better. Right. That's a good, that's, those are a couple good illustrations, car and, and the human body and the volcano. I always get amazed at how, like, like, like with before planted a vegetable garden, no one else in the neighborhood has one. But where do the squash bugs and the tomato worms and stuff come from? <laughs> you know, it happens. So. Yeah. How do they come? They're already in the ground. I think it's. I think they're in the seeds. You just, yeah, just a lot of amazing things we uh, we can see there. But yeah, it's good, the idea of release. So that's Cindy and I. Cindy, Cindy used to hike to back March 13, 2001. We were in the Grand Canyon, at, and we were at the Indian Gardens level. So we were about 3,000 people up and down. Oh, and we hear these kids decide, "Wow, wow!" It's like two o'clock in the morning. So we get up and we go out. And like five or six or more every minute shooting stars, uh -huh. meteor shower, and it just kept going on and on and on. And uh, I've been there uh, after Cindy stopped hiking at that one time, <laughs> and you know, you look up and you know, I know probably others here from the country, but during the Grand Canyon, there is like no light, no light. And you see them. <laughs> it really, yeah, it really, it really does look like you melt. Know, there's so many stars. Yeah. And then two other, two other occasions. I've been, I've been at twenty thousand six hundred feet sleeping one night, and in the crater of the Grand Canyon, uh, not Grand Canyon, crater of the uh, Kilimanjaro, sleeping, and looking down, looking down at lightning happening below. You were above it. Uh -huh. which I know we've, we've all seen probably from, from aircraft, uh -huh. but, but I mean, it's, just, it's an eerie feeling to, to realize you're above what's happening there. And, uh, 
So it's just some remarkable sights. Yeah, and Sydney told me a story I was going to remember, and I can't. <laughs> <laughs> last week, but she, she talked about something that was, I, I don't know whether you'll remember it or not, but uh, yeah, the, the, the amazing, the same in, in Petra, we're in, uh, just in the canyon there, or in the area by the treasury, this is on uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, that treasury building, and you look up, uh, when they turn all dark, you look up and there's the Big Dipper and other stars, and wow, you know, and you're, uh, you know, so we're not used to that because of all our light around here. You look up, you see a few stars, but you don't see a lot. You have to get further out. So it's always an amazing thing to see the stars. There, we, we were at the uh, Painted Desert and uh, Petrified Forest, that was it. And that, you know, it's just as level as it can be. Yeah. And here's all these petrified trees, and they're broken to pieces. And they would tell us, well, that's because the mountains trunk there anymore, you know, push these trees up, and then they, when they were receding, it's like that the trees fell and they broke into all these pieces. It's kind of like, you know, it's just as level as it can possibly be. <laughs> and then, then they said, you know, they were doing radio, or what is it, carbon dating, whatever, uh, they said that, uh, you know, they come up with ages, but we're not able to explain at the Mount St. Helens, the trees in that area are petrifying at like hundreds of times the rate that they're supposed to be petrifying as so we don't really understand how that might affect our, our yeah. methodology. Surprise! <laughs> uh, and I think God sometimes, you know, that's people study that and so God's saying, well you think you know, figure this one out. <laughs> and then you've got you've got you've got in the Old Testament you've got ways of diagnosing people. Then as we got smarter we started bloodletting putting leeches on them, and now what we're doing comes a little bit closer to back there than what they putting leeches on them. No leeches, it seems like leeches are somewhat of a benefit, which is interesting. Not that I want one on. Okay, the bells ring. Thank you very much. Next week we're all over the building. <laughs>